Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everyone. So this uh, session is the data set showcase. And the idea behind this session, um, and by the way, I just want to double check, you can hear me on Zoom, right, and see the screen? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, the, the purpose of this session is to introduce you to a, a bunch of different data sets and ways that you can access them for uh, potential use in your hack projects next week. Um, and I'll just start out by saying that uh, uh, the list of data sets we're going to go over are uh, supposed to be exemplary. Like they're supposed to, they're supposed to show you how to do this. Um, but uh, I'll just say that I study vision and uh, primarily uh, human vision. Ariel primarily studies diffusion weighted MRI, and so we have a little bit of a bias in the data sets we're going to show you towards those particular topics. Um, this shouldn't make you feel like you can only use these data sets. Um, there's lots and lots of data sets out there, uh, especially on Open Neuro, which we'll talk about at the end. Um, and if you have a data set that you would like to use that isn't one of the ones that we show you, um, let us know. We can help you try to get it working. Um, very likely, there'll be some way we can use the tools we show today to, to do that. Okay, so um, for this session, uh, we have a bunch of notebooks we're going to go through. If you just go to the curriculum on Jupyter Hub. And then you go into the uh, Rokum Benson data sharing, uh, sorry, data, uh, data showcase. Um, there's a series of notebooks here and a utilities.py file, which just contains a few very simple functions we use in these notebooks. Um, and we're just going to kind of walk through these uh, together. So uh, the first thing we want to talk about here, and I'm going to uh, collapse this sidebar. Well, we'll need it, so I'll just make it smaller. Um, OK. Uh, Okay, so before we uh, get into any of the specific data sets, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the tools we can use for accessing data sets. I'm going to start by introducing you to this uh, library, this, this uh, uh, built-in library that's part of Python called, in, called Pathlib. Um, Pathlib should be installed for any version of Python 3, I believe. Um, and uh, the basic idea behind Pathlib is it's a library that makes it much easier to work with the file system. So rather than um, having to worry about, for example, am I on Windows or Linux and do I use forward slashes or backslashes or these kinds of, of, of issues, um, Pathlib just makes a lot of this much simpler. Um, so before Pathlib, there was this sort of uh, canonical way of doing things, whoops, um, a sort of canonical way of doing things where you use the OS module and you could do things like join together uh, directories and subdirectories and, and create files that way. Um, Pathlib simplifies this quite a bit. So um, here we have a little code block that just demonstrates uh, how you might use Pathlib. Um, Pathlib contains a class called path, which represents a path on the file system. Um, it could be a file or directory. Uh, and the idea is you can create a path. So here we create a path for our home directory, um, uh, slash home slash Jovian, which is the home directory on the, the uh, Jupyter Hub server. Um, and then we have a string that for a subdirectory, the curricul curriculum directory specifically. And since base path here is a path object, we can uh, just make a new path uh, for that subdirectory by saying path, uh, base path slash subdir as if we were doing division. Now that's a little bit of a weird kind of, um, it, may, it may look a little weird uh, if you're not used to languages that allow for things like operator overloading, like redefining what division means for an object. But the basic idea here is that in paths, at least in, in Linux paths, we use forward slash to separate directories and subdirectories or directories and the files they contain. And so we use a forward slash here uh, to separate the base path from the subdirectory. Any questions on this basic idea? OK, so this is for working with the file system on your local computer. Um, and is it necessarily how we're going to get it's, it's not how we're going to get access to these data sets. Um, but uh, we're going to use a very similar library, which I'll introduce in just a second, um, called CloudPathLib, which will uh, represent uh, files in the cloud. Now, um, uh, when when you're working with your uh, with data sets next week, one of the things that we'd like to encourage you to do is, um, you know, we can in theory download a data set into the shared directory, or you can download a data set to your your home directory. But we'd rather you not just download the whole data set and operate on it because um, you all have limited, we, we have limited space in the Neuro Academy Jupyter Hub. And if all of you download the entire HPC, we'll run out of space before about 10 of you have done it. So um, we'd like to encourage you 
to instead um, use a cache directory where you can cache a single subject as you operate on it, or you can cache a, a bit of the directory, a bit of the data set as you operate on it. And then um, when you finished with it, you can clear that cache directory and start over with the next subject. Um, if this is assuming you want to do some kind of analysis of subjects in one of these data sets. Um, and uh, we'll be around to help with uh, creating that kind of workflow uh, next week. Um, in fact, we, we may have a session on a, a breakout session on, on Tuesday, maybe. Um, we're still figuring that out. But uh, regardless, um, what we're going to do here with Pathlib in this, this first cell is go ahead and create a cache path. Um, and this will just store data temporarily as we as we uh, operate on it. And we'll use this cache path uh, throughout this these uh, these notebooks. So we just make a path uh, for slash temp slash cache. Slash temp, if you've never used it in Linux, it usually stores uh, a sort of temporary file system where you can often very quickly cache objects. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, we make a path object here. Now, temp slash cache doesn't necessarily exist as a directory. It's just a, a path we made up. So down here, we can say, if uh, the cache path doesn't exist, go ahead and make that directory. Um, and so I'm just going to run this cell. Uh, and that'll create that temp slash cache, slash temp slash cache directory. Um, and here, I just this is just to kind of demonstrate a little bit of how uh, Pathlib works. If we wanted to create a README file in that cache directory, we can start by saying, okay, uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Um, we can start by saying, okay, we'll we'll make a path for the README file, um, which is the cache path slash readme.md. And then we can uh, we can say with readme file .open, um, as a writable text file um, as file, and then we can print a bunch of things to that file. Now, um, at least in in the Python session I went over, we didn't get uh, we didn't get quite or that uh, Kelly Kelly gave earlier. Um, we didn't get quite as far as talking about opening files, um, but uh, this is a pretty common paradigm if you've never seen it before, where you can say. Basically, I want to open a file that's going to be named file, um, and then it'll stay open uh, as long as you're running within this with block. And then as soon as you end the with block, it'll automatically close. And here we can just print things and tell the print function that we want um, the, the things we print to go into this file. Um, so let's just go ahead and run this. Um, no, no output, no error. That's a good sign. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and cat it so we can we can see what's in that file that we just theoretically wrote out. And if we run that, we get uh, all the lines that we wrote up here. So it looks like that worked. Any questions on this? Okay. So um, uh, let's see. We uh, I mentioned that we have this utilities file that has a bunch of little utilities. This is just an example of one. Um, the idea is you. Uh, this is an ls function to list the contents of a directory. The idea is you give it a path and it, it just gives you back a list of the things in the subject or the contents of that directory. So if I go ahead and run this, um, we define that function. And then if I do an ls of the cache path, um, we can see that it gives us back uh, a path object, specifically a POSIX path object. POSIX is uh, the standard that uh, Linux adheres to when it comes to file systems. So this is basically a, a kind of path or a, a subclass of the path class. Um, and we can see that the only uh, thing it found in this directory is the readme file because that's all that's there. That's that's all we put there so far. Okay. So um, there's this really great library called Cloud Pathlib, which is a lot like Pathlib, but it works not just for things on your file system, but also for things in the cloud. And this makes accessing a lot of these data sets much, much easier because you can almost treat them like they're just things on your computer or on your local hard drive or wherever you're operating. Um, so uh, I just want to give you a quick example um, using the natural scenes data set. We'll go over the natural scenes data set in a little bit here, but um, real quick, just to show an example of how Cloud Pathlib works, um, I'm going to start by saying from Cloud Pathlib, import S3 path and S3 client. Um, now, if you weren't in the cloud computing session, S3 is the name for Amazon's um, file storage uh, system. Uh, basically, if you have, you can put data in S3 and kind of treat it like uh, a file system up in the cloud. Um, it, it costs some money typically, um, but for us to use it, it's free. We can just download these data um, from S, the S3 protocol. So uh, in order to, since we're connecting to a server, we need to at least initially when we, when we create our first connection, we need to tell um, the cloud path live about the kind of the client, uh, which kind of handles details of the connection. 
Um, so this client object uh, is saying, first of all, we're going to use that cache path we made as the directory in which the cloud path lib caches uh, files and things that it needs to cache. So we start out by just telling uh, the S3 client that that's where it's going to cache data. And then we have this uh, option here that's no sign request equal true. So what this refers to is the fact that um, the natural scenes data set doesn't require authentication. You don't need to like have a username and a password or an, a key and a secret in order to log in and access the natural scenes data set. So we're just saying we're not we're not trying to authenticate it here. That's that's what this means. Um, if you're accessing something like the human connectome project, we'll see in a little bit here. Um, you'll need to tell the uh, the S3 client where it can find the credentials. Um, and by the way, I, uh, if you didn't see in the general chat, there's some instructions on getting uh, authentication to the Human Connectome Project. If you want to use the Human Connectome Project next week, or if you want to follow along with our examples, you'll need to have done that already. Um, it's very simple. It takes about five minutes. Okay, so we uh, we make this client here, and then we just make an S3 path, and we just provide the the path um, in S3 that we want to we want to look at. So here we have S3 colon slash slash natural scenes data set. Um, and this will give us basically the directory at the root of the natural scenes data set. And we pass in uh, as an option, the client uh, that we've established here. So if I run this, um, uh, it creates a, uh, an S3 path object and I'll just show us that. Um, there we have an S3 path. Uh, and um, what makes CloudPath, at least what I think makes CloudPath live very useful, is that these S3 path objects behave almost exactly like path objects. So even though we wrote this ls function to work with a path object from pathlib, we can now pass a, a CloudPathLib object. And when we ask for the uh, for an, uh, listing of the contents of the NSD base path, uh, what we get back is um, a bunch of S3 paths uh, that already know about the client that we established up here. Um, that uh, represent the uh, contents of the natural scenes data set. Uh, any questions on this so far? Okay, so we're gonna encourage you to use this cloud path lib um, for access uh, next week. And we'll be uh, demonstrating how to access all these other data sets with cloud path lib. Um, so I think we're ready to talk about the HCP. Um, Ariel, do you wanna take over for this one? Yeah, you're welcome. All right, uh, so the first data set that we'll talk about is the Human Connectome Project. The Human Connectome Project is it's kind of a response to a grand challenge set by the NIH. The goal is to collect an unprecedented data set of functional structural connectivity in the human brain. And um, the NIH actually funded two different consortia to work on this, on this project. One is the Harvard MGH UCLA consortium. And the other one was this um, Washington University and University of Minnesota consortium. And really the, the data that we're gonna focus on here is, is the one from this, this second consortium, the Wu Min. Their approach was to develop a set of uh, scanning protocols uh, and informatics infrastructure and processing pipelines, uh, and then apply all of those to the collection of data from 1,200 uh, young, healthy individuals um, and distribute that data openly, uh, including both all of the raw data, of course, but also kind of like minimally processed data um, derivatives. Um, as mentioned here, there are follow-up projects to this original project that are kind of rolling out uh, continuously ever since, including um, several on lifespan development that are at a pretty advanced stages, at least uh, kind of for childhood and, and aging, and disease connectomes that focus specifically on a variety of different kinds of disorders. The idea there was, let's take this these protocols, these kind of measurements, and informatics infrastructure, processing pipelines, and let's replicate them in various different kinds of uh, diseases or in lifespan uh, in a way that we can then uh, compare to the, the young adults uh, as kind of a baseline. Okay, so the, the measurements that were done uh, include uh, structural MRI, diffusion-weighted MRI, functional, both uh, task-evoked and resting state MRI, 
for sub, a subset of the subjects, there are also measurements, uh, functional MRI measurements done in um, uh, seven Tesla MRI in Minnesota. Um, there is uh, an over, the, the, the sample was collected with an oversampling of, uh, of twin pairs so that uh, certain uh, heritability analyses could be done. Uh, there's extensive uh, phenotypic data and various other things. There's also for some of these uh, resting state and task developed MEG data and extensively pre-processed. Um, so there are many places you can get this data. I want us to go to this humanconnectome.org uh, website and start downloading things, um, but really maybe more economical and more um, uh, in, in line with what we were, we're trying to do here is to use the data that is available. The Amazon Web Services have an open data um, open data project that hosts open data sets of, uh, of significance or importance, scientific importance. These include many data sets in other fields like in geosciences and uh, uh, the, I think the, the common web crawl is hosted there and, and things of that sort, but there are also a variety of data sets relevant specifically to neuroscience. So you'll see, uh, I think basically everything we'll show here will be data sets that are stored on the AWS open data program. Um, so for HCP specifically, HCP, in order to access the HCP data, you need to agree to certain terms and conditions. These terms, terms and conditions actually for kind of the basic access to the neuroimaging data are extremely, um, I'd say, uh, lenient in the sense that you don't need to commit to a lot in order to access. You basically need to agree, if I remember correctly. There's, there's a whole, the, the agreement is a whole page. And, legalese, but it's very light legalese that you can read uh, easily and quickly, and says that you're promising basically not to try to re-identify these individuals, and that if you further share the data, you'll share it under similar kinds of conditions with other people. But they also agree not to you know, re-identify these people. So it's it's very straightforward. Um, so you need to go to humanconnectome.org in order to agree to that. And once you do that, and maybe I'll try to kind of show what this looks like. Whoops, there we go. Let's see if this is what it's going to do. Right. Um, and log in. Oh, you need to go to the, I think, dd.humanconnectome. I think it's human connected. There you go. Um, and log in, let's see. Okay, unfortunately my browser remembers that. Um, once you're here, you can, um, and, and if you've agreed and you've logged in here and you can click on that and that will give you, oops, uh, don't want to flash that for too long. That was, that was just, oh, that was just my key, okay, good. <laughs> uh, so I'll do that again, there's a key here, okay. <laughs> that doesn't help. Uh, anyone nefarious who finds this video on YouTube. So so, so you need that and you'll need in addition also the the uh, the uh, so that's the access key ID and the secret access key. Uh, just kind of as a parenthesis here, this is the way that uh, AWS manages um, access. Uh, you can think of this as sort of like a username and password combination that you might have like I just logged into this database. Uh, but you can store it in your file system. And in fact, um, uh, AWS, there is a conventional place to store that, which is in a hidden folder um, in my home directory called .aws. These folders that start with the dot are hidden. If I type ls, I don't see them, but if I type plus AWS, then you'll see that there's like a file called credentials in here. And there are some instructions. Um, not the right one. There's some instructions here about how you can fairly easily write your key ID 
access key ID and secret access key into those credentials in the file system in the Jupyter Hub. Um, another way to do that would be to type AWS configure, uh, which would then take you through the possibility of, yeah, of writing in those things there um, with the one caveat that you'd need to probably edit that file a little bit to change um, um, this little square bracketed thing from default to HCP. So we want that to be your HCP credentials. So we need to sort of open that up in a text editor. I won't show that right now because it has my credentials in there, but um, we can we can walk you through that uh, later. But if, if you do this, these steps here, entering your the access key ID here and your um, okay. secret access key there that you got from db.humanconnectome.org, then you will be then able to run the next lines of code as well. Okay, so here's how you access the HCP data on S3 uh, using um, pathlib and uh, cloud pathlib. So again, we're creating this cache path using the pathlib. This is where data will be cached temporarily every time that we're accessing data from say one subject. Um, if it doesn't exist, we're creating it. This is something that we want to do every time that we interact with uh, uh, with uh, cloud path lib or with this kind of cloud stored data. Um, the next thing determines the, um, sets up a client as Noah mentioned before, uh, in some cases, the client requires some authentication. Here, we're telling it, use for authentication this profile name HCP that we created here. So that file, the, the file with the credentials that we have stored in here has different, can have different profiles. It can have a default profile. It can have a profile specifically for access to the Human Connectome project. So those will be different sections in, in this file. In the simple case, we're working here and you haven't set up credentials for it, uh, AWS yet, you'll have this one section for HCP that will be the only profile. Nevertheless, we need to tell it about this uh, profile that exists. And then we need to tell it where things will be ca cached. That's our local cache path. And then in the same line of code here, we're also pointing and saying, this is where we'd like to access the data from. So uh, HCP open access is, uh, th this is an S3 path. So S3 path is, uh, S3 is again, is the simple storage service, AWS is storage for data. And this is points to a particular bucket. These uh, big uh, stores of data are called buckets. So this is the HCP open access bucket inside of the AWS open uh, data program. And under that, we're pointing specifically to HCP underscore 1200, which is the, where the, the most recent kind of iteration, the, the last iteration of collection of data is stored. Um, okay. Once we do that, we can then um, iterate through uh, the, the this base path through this directory, this object that we created here, this kind of cloud path object has an iterator method that we're calling here. And, in, but instead of showing this, this will show a list of the directories that are stored under this 1200. And that's a directory with all of the subjects. So in order not to show all of the subjects, we select uh, 10 of those. And you can see that we get, uh, you remember before, uh, when Noah's showing local paths, he had this POSIX path object. Now we have an S3 path object. It's also a subclass of the path object and um, points to, in this case, directories for these 10 first subjects. Uh, in the human connector project. Uh, in the utilities uh, fun or utilities file here, Noah's implemented a function called crawl and crawl then allows us to uh, do just that for say a single subject. So now we can see, uh, or for a single, a single sub path of the uh, HCP base path. So here we're going um, using these, these slashes to combine together. We're gonna look just at this um, this subject here, uh, we're going to further go into their T1 weighted, and then inside of the T1 weighted, for some reason, there's again their sub subject ID, which is where their free surfer, uh, the, the free surfer processing uh, ended up. Uh, I, yeah, it's it's there. And anyway, you can crawl it, 
And if you crawl it, you see that there's all kinds of free software things that come up, um, including all the kind of processing derivatives from free surfer. So lots of things. Uh, this is nice because you know if you wanted free surfer things for the HCP subjects, there it all is, and it'll be in the same place for every subject. Not so you can iterate over all the subjects, download, refer one by one to the subjects, do the thing you wanted to do subject by subject using this kind of approach, and then um, kind of like looping over the subjects, for example. And um, at no point, if you use this approach, would you have the entire, all of the data for all of the subjects on your on your file system because we're using this kind of caching approach. We're caching, we're processing, and then we're going to the next subject and caching their data and so on. So, so that's uh, very uh, efficient in terms of storage. Um, we can directly refer to certain data. For example, here we're going to use the, the uh, Nibabel, Python Nibabel library that knows how to uh, read various kinds of uh, uh, file formats for neuroimaging. We're referring specifically to the uh, brain extracted MGZ as a file format that was produced by FreeSurfer. So we're kind of pointing to the FreeSurfer path inside there to the MRI sub path and then to the sp specific file. And if we put this kind of FS path after this, then um, automatically under the hood, uh, cloud path uh, lib will um, download this thing into the cache and have now a local kind of copy of this thing that you can then um, get the data from here through using its data object. Read into first of all, read into Nibabel and then use Nibabel's um, functionality in order to refer to a particular slice and then display that. So, data is uh, very straightforwardly accessible as a path. You're, you're pointing into a path in the cloud, but then you're operating on this, this path as though it is stored, uh, as though it's in the file system of your machine through this FS path um, attribute of, of this thing. Um, so this is something we'll very much like to kind of enforce or reinforce for you to do to kind of direct you towards uh, one of the benefits of this, uh, something that you'll start thinking about next week as you're working on things. If you're working on these data sets that are stored in the cloud, at some point, Wednesday or Thursday, you'll start asking us, uh, can we keep doing this after the end of NERC? Like we're working on this project, we're interested in it, we'd like to be able to use the things that we're doing further. And the answer just in advance for the hub is, well, the hub will continue to exist for a little bit, but eventually we'll need to turn it off and send you off on your own. One of the nice things about this approach is that it doesn't matter on which machine you're running this. So long as these cloud paths are continue to exist and they will continue to exist, uh, so long as the HTTP and AWS keep maintaining that bucket, this same code will work whether I run it on the hub or on my laptop or on some other machine, so long as I guess the necessary libraries are installed on that. So it's really nice because it also allows for the portability of everything. If you write it in this way, it'll be portable to um, for you to take, take home with you and continue working on things. And then of course this enhances reproducibility because like I said, it doesn't matter if you're running it on your machine or on somebody else's machine, somebody else can download then the things that you're doing, run it in the same way and get exactly the same data from the same location. Okay, let me stop here. What what questions do you have about human connectome project? Yes. The question is: Let's assume I had the I don't know forty terabytes to store uh, all of the human connectome project data. Uh, should I still be doing this and? Uh, uh, for reproducibility purposes, that is, I think, one of the reasons, and there's efficiency also. And um, I mean, if you, even if you had the space, is this really what you want to use the space for to make a copy of data that's already there? Um, so I, I mean, this is how I, I do stuff. Yeah. Uh, if I have my own data collected within the center, yeah. Uh, that would typically for us be sort of some of the drive, 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 wake up, not with the exact steps or better. No, it's just like kind of a big thing. That's also, yeah. 
Yeah, so crowd clock lib, at least for these kind of abstractions, is very specific for the AWS infrastructure and how that is organized. The good news is that many universities are uh, creating data storage that mimics AWS's S3 because it's so useful and it, ha it has a lot of advantages. So, for example, I know that I've, I've worked with people at the University of Minnesota. They basically have an S3 clone. They have S3 running on their own servers uh, because it's such. There's so many tools to work with it. So that answer is basically no, but maybe in some future this this stuff will also work on. Uh, on that thing. I believe uh, I believe CloudPathLib has modules for, and I think they're all installed here for Google's uh, cloud storage, for Amazon, for uh, Azure, and one other that I'm forgetting. <laughs> Oracle. I don't think it's Oracle. I think it's just <laughs> M3. Yeah. You know? Okay, yeah, the big three. Okay, I'll pass it back to no for red and time. Okay, so we're actually going to talk about a few of the different data types in the Human Connection Project. One of the nice things about the Human Connection Project is that there's a lot of different kinds of data for all these subjects or for many of the subjects. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I study vision, and um, one of the pieces of the Human Connection Project was that for almost 200 of the subjects, they did uh, seven Tesla MRI scanning, uh, functional MRI scanning, um, which included retinotopic mapping uh, protocols. So real quick, if you're not a vision person, that's fine. Um, retinotopic mapping is where we put you in a scanner for like uh, 30 minutes or so, and have you fixate at the center of the screen while a very boring stimulus just kind of, of uh, bars and rings and wedges just kind of sweep across the screen slowly. And we use that to map out which part of your uh, visual cortex responds to which part of your visual field. And there's these very nice maps in visual cortex uh, that we'll look at in just a second here. So if um, if you're interested in maps or cortical surface analysis or, or visual processing, this is a great resource here. Um, now for the, the retinotopic, uh, for the, the human connectome project retinotopy data set, it's actually not stored on S3 because um, uh, the group that uh, solved the, so I, I was what part of the group that solved the retinotopic mapping. We took the data and turned it into useful um, uh, maps and not just bold signals. Um, we weren't part of the human connectome project, so we didn't have access to their S3 bucket. So we instead stored all these data on the uh, open science framework. And there's a library called NeuroPythe that I maintain that can access these. So real quick, um, we have just a little bit of setup that tells NeuroPythe about our cache path and uh, about our human connectome project credentials here. So I'm just gonna run that. Um, and then basically we can ask NeuroPythe to give us a human connectome project subject um, by the subject LD. So this will give us back an object that represents uh, this particular subject. And then um, uh, just as a quick demo, we're gonna make a plot of the subject's cortex. We're gonna use the left and right hemisphere and we're gonna show the white surface. Um, that is the boundary between the white matter and the gray matter. Um, and I'm just going to run that. And this should pop up a 3D model, assuming everything's working in the hub, um, of uh, both right and left cortex. It will take a second because it needs to download the data. And then, yeah, there it is. Um, that was actually pretty quick. Uh, so this is just a, this is a 3D model of this subject's brain. Um, and uh, um, we, can, uh, we can then take the same thing and say, okay, let's, Instead of, instead of just plotting the curvature map, let's plot this on the inflated brain. And we're gonna take uh, the area V1, which is primary visual cortex. Um, V1 is actually labeled by FreeSurfer as part of the FreeSurfer processing. So um, we can just say, look, take V1 and color it red. Um, so I'll just go ahead and run that. Um, so here we can see the inflated brain with this subject's uh, V1 highlighted in red. Um, this is back here is where all the visual cortex is. So uh, this is where we'll be seeing maps for the red topic mapping data. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things um, when we when we convert bold time series into red topic maps, um, one of the things we get is a fraction of the variance that we can explain in the bold time series. So the, essentially, we have a model of the way that uh, your visual field is laid out on on uh, cortex, and we have a model of how a particular point in the visual field would respond to the, the experiment. And we can ask how much of the variance in the bold signal from that experiment can we explain with this model. Um, and so this is sort of a confidence measure. 
And what I'm saying here is I want, I want to create a mask where uh, for the population receptive field variance explained is between 10% uh, and 100%. So we're kind of limiting, um, we're going to limit this plot to uh, just the parts of the brain that seem to respond to the visual field or to the visual stimulation pretty well. Um, we're going to pl plot what's called the polar angle. I'll explain what that is in just a second. Um, and we're going to do it on the inflated surface. Um, so when we run this, uh, we're going to get, we're going to see the retinotopic maps. And uh, while this kind of runs, this will take a, a second because it needs to download the retinotopy data as well. Um, but uh, below here, I just have a, a simple, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. It just creates a legend of uh, polar angle. And uh, polar angle is basically, um, polar angle refers to uh, the sensitivity of the visual of your cor of cortex to rotation around the visual field. Um, so here's a, here's a legend. If this is the visual field and you're looking right at the center, um, I've just colored the visual field uh, by hue basically. Um, and up here, now that we have this plotted, we can see the polar angle maps where um, each point on cortex is respond is colored according to the part of the visual field that it responds to most strongly. So this red here basically indicates, whoops, if we look at this map or this legend that that part of cortex responds to the lower visual field, the cyan is the upper visual field. And we can see that back here where V1 was, there's sort of a gradient from the lower to the upper visual field. And you can see that in both, um, both uh, hemispheres so that's that's where V1 is, and, and together the two halves of V1 represent a whole visual field. Um, okay, so if you're interested in vision, this is a great data set to use. Um, this There's a whole lot of other data uh, that was collected uh, with functional MRI in the Human Connectome Project. There's movie watching data, there's working memory tasks, there's emotional uh, recognition tasks, and we have these really nice maps of the visual field. So if you're interested in comparing any of this to to uh, visual processing, this is a great data set for it, and you can access it using uh, these libraries. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay, so next we'll talk about the Human Connectome Project Diffusion MRI. So in addition to the functional MRI, the Human Connection Project developed these really fantastic uh, protocols for collecting diffusion MRI. Um, I should say even, the, even though data collection has ended a pretty long time ago, this far exceeds uh, the kind of resolution and SNR and um, uh, coverage of, of uh, uh, different kinds of B values, uh, that you can do uh, in say a standard scanner here on campus. It's like an extremely good protocol at very high resolution, 1.25 millimeters isotropic with uh, three different diffusion weighting values. It'd be values of around 1,000, 2,000 and 3,000. Each one measured 90 different directions. Uh, it's, it's really, really massive. And because of that, this data set is still being used extensively to do basic research that uses diffusion MRI on really a variety of different topics. Um, a lot of methods development uses this, this data set because it's uh, such a high quality data set. Uh, but also you can ask a lot of um, basic, basic research questions using this data that are hard to ask with, uh, uh, other, with other data uh, just because of its quality and resolution and so on. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of a background on diffusion MRI. Diffusion MRI is uses uh, magnetic field gradients to sensitize the measurement to the diffusion of water in every voxel and in multiple different directions. I've already mentioned this idea of uh, diffusion weightings. So you can set those gradients to be sensitive to different uh, kind of profiles of uh, water diffusion in every location. You can use information from different diffusion weightings in combination in order to make all kinds of inferences about uh, properties of the tissue within the, the human brain tissue, in particular within white matter. Um, for example, here, a uh, model has been fit to some data. This is not actually not human connectome project uh, data, but diffusion MRI data nonetheless. And this left map here is a map of mean diffusivity. So mean diffusivity you can think of as 
how how far does the water molecule travel randomly during the time that the experiment happens, which is uh, maybe like 100 milliseconds or so here. During that time, how much does a water molecule travel uh, randomly from where it started in different locations? And if you're in the ventricles, then there's not a lot of tissue that kind of restricts the motion of the water. And you can think of the water traveling a little bit further. And that's you can infer back the diffusivity, the properties of the, the physical property of diffusivity of the water within here. And here it's high and here it's it's pretty low inside of the, the tissue where there's a lot of tissue that restricts the, the ability of water molecules to move. Now, the in white matter tissue in particular, where the axons are traveling, water motion is restricted along some directions more than along other directions. So if you're going along the length of the axons, water can travel more along that length because there's not as much stuff impeding its motion. But if you're trying to go perpendicular to the, um, uh, or orthogonal to the, the um, to the axons, there's myelin, there's the axons themselves, there's other axons, there's all these barriers. And so there's not a lot of diffusion there. And this map in the middle is a map of fractional anisotropy, which is a, a number between zero and one that quantifies how uh, isotropic is the diffusion or how anisotropic actually is the diffusion. So if we're going uh, zero, that's something that's completely isotropic, sort of like in the ventricles, we get roughly zero. So you can see that here also, roughly zero fractional anisotropy. But if we're in the core of the white matter, we get fractional anisotropy that's rather high for one. Year. This map here is a map of uh, the principal diffusion direction coded as red for right, left, uh, green for anterior, posterior, and blue for inferior, uh, superior. And we use this kind of information in order to do um, things like tractography and so on. Okay, so how do we access this data? Um, in the Human Connectome Project, same principle as before. Uh, this, this, these lines of code will probably exist in many of the notebooks that you will write um, next week. Uh, we're gonna use the utilities, we're gonna use Nebabel. Uh, this is exactly as it was before in the, the previous notebook that I showed you, uh, setting up a client, setting up a path for the HTTP base. And then um, here I'm gonna, I'm actually showing you all the different things that are in the, the base uh, path. So there's sort of like this HTTP 1200 that we accessed before. There was a previous release that had 900 subjects. There's uh, something called HTTP retest, which may be interesting for some of you. 45 subjects were uh, measured in on two different sessions. So the retest data for those 45 subjects is is in in this folder um, or in this in this location. And for every subject, say in HCP 1200, the first subject inside of the T1 weighted folder, for some reason, uh, there's a folder called diffusion. And in there, uh, we can access a variety of things, including some of the information about, um, about the pre-processing that happened here, uh, but uh, primarily for of interest to you if you're interested in the diffusion is sort of like pre-processed, pre minimally pre-processed data, the B values, the B vectors, which in, encode in text the directions and weightings of the diffusion gradients and then the data itself. So here I'm going to point directly to the diffusion data and then demonstrate again um, that you can um, read this with Nebabel. Um, one cool and pretty, so right now what's happening is actually the data is streaming in from in into this, into the machine on which uh, the uh, Jupiter Hub is running from uh, S3, and that takes a little while because it's uh, it's a pretty large amount of data. I think it's around four gigs of, of data that just went through there. But actually, this is uh, probably in answer to some of the questions that were asked before, maybe. And this is probably the fastest way you can do this because our Jupiter Hub is running on AWS. This data is in AWS, so this is a direct connection between two AWS machines talking to each other. So that's just about as fast as you can get this data. Um, and then if you want, so here, Nebabel actually does oops, something pretty useful, which is that it's it's lazy loading this. It wasn't loaded into memory. The data is not in memory in this Python process, uh, but it's, it's it's it has the data. It knows where the data is, and it read just come, some header information. Uh, if you really want to get the data, you would have to uncomment this, and this would uh, provide the full sort of array of, of diffusion data, um, which is, like I said, pretty large. Okay, let me stop here. What questions do you have about accessing the diffusion data, diffusion data more generally?
Okay. No questions. I'll just go one step further, which is to tell you that one thing that my group has done is to take this data and process it even further. So this data is useful because you can do a lot of things with it. I mentioned tractography, and you can do tractography with this data. Uh, but if you're interested in sort of understanding um, individual differences in this data, and you would like to access data that has been processed already, then we've made that data uh, publicly available. Um, our processing pipeline focuses on something that we call tractometry. The idea behind tractometry is that you can look at the tissue properties, things like fractional anisotropy, along the length of major bundles like the corticospinal tract and the arcuate fasciculus. And some and Dora's, Dora's uh, presentation earlier set this up really nicely because many of the bundles that she showed are bundles that our software um, <clears throat> finds and then uh, that delineates these uh, what we call track profiles along the length of these tracks. So here is an example from the paper that introduced this method um, that we call automated fiber quantification or AFQ. Uh, it's a subset of tractometry. It's a particular method of tractometry. Um, and here you can see every subject is a gray line and the average is, is this red thing. And you can think of it as the tissue properties along the length of this bundle, in this case, is the cortical spine track. Again, this is not human connectome project uh, data, but the principle still applies. This is human connectome project data. So we did this for all of the subjects in the human connectome project. Um, and here is sort of the average. And um, I think we did it for something like 24 different bundles, including def several different uh, uh, subdivisions of the, the corpus callosum. And then we made that available, available through a project called the Open Neuro Data Project, not to be confused with Open Neuro, the Open Neuro Data Project um, that is uh, uh, run out of um, Johns Hopkins University includes many different data sets in neuroscience, both at multiple different scales, all the way from sort of microscopy data, um, large microscopy images of various uh, uh, measurements, um, and all the way to sort of human MRI derivatives. So we've, we've made it available there. Uh, that one doesn't require authentication. So we can set up a client like we did before with no sign request equal true. And then we can access the data. So the, the bucket is called open-neurodata. Uh, under that, there's something called uh, my last name uh, because they organize it that way there. And then in there, there's the HCP 1200 and AFQ is this method of quantification. And here we can look at what's for every subject. What we have, we have a variety of regions of interest that we use. So we kind of dumped in there all the derivatives of the uh, processing that we did, which included both. Um, so here's things that are more interesting, like the different bundles, uh, but also things like maps of um, fractional isotropy, mean diffusivity, um, uh, tractography in two different file formats, TRX and TRK. Uh, at various levels of cleaning, uh, like before and after finding all of these bundles. And then uh, there is in here a, a CSV file that includes the track profiles for this individual. Um, so pointing to that with uh, pandas read CSV will then um, give us a data frame that contains the FA, MD, mean kurtosis, and Ex axonal water fraction, which are sort of der derivatives of diffusion that you can calculate when you have multiple B values along the length of all the tracks. Um, the node ID designates like the length along the track. So you can get that. You can do a little bit of fil filtering that I'm demonstrating here and get, for example, in this case, the fractional anisotropy uh, for only those nodes that belong to the left corticospinal tract and then plot that. So you can do that for every subject, you can do it for every bundle, you can do it for different locations, you can combine that together with uh, other things about the human connectome project uh, subjects, for example, their retinotopy data, uh, and start figuring all that kinds of things out about them. What questions do you have about this processing? I really went quickly here through this processing, but hopefully that's clear enough that the data is there and you can Play with it. I should mention also under this open neurodata, for those of you interested in HCP and connectivity, under this open neurodata in a slightly different location that I can I can find and point out to you. There are also uh, the group, uh, Joshua Bogelstein's group, who 
maintains this, this open neurodata project, also process the human connectome project and they provide um, another kind of diff diffusion derivative, which is uh, matrices of connectivity, sort of counting streamlines between different uh, parcels in the cortex. So that you can combine, say, with a functional MRI graphs and things of that sort. Okay, so if you're interested in those kinds of things, then we can uh, point you to where those things are. Yeah, JP. Very inside question, so maybe not very relevant, but um, uh, the uh, DUA of the HCP allows you to uh, put any derived data anywhere but in credential masking. Because that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised because, you know, you could, I mean, you know, defining what is a derivative, you could take, you know, almost the same data and, you know, make, make that almost like, you know, no, you know, almost raw data, but not exactly raw data. And, uh, so I'm a, a bit surprised at the, uh, the Anyway, um, I, in, in my reading, yes. So long as when I share it with others, they agree to use it in, in the way that was originally intended. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They have a lot of restrictions. So they have a set of restrictive data that we didn't really talk about here. Okay. So by the way, if you're interested in looking at the restricted data, which includes things like behavioral measures and family structures and gender and age and some of this kind of stuff that's considered uh, uh, potentially identifiable, um, you can get access to that. It usually takes them like a week to process those. So if it's something you want to work with, let me know. We can probably figure out a system where you write some code and I run out of restricted data and give you results back or something. But um, with restricted data, there's a lot more restrictions. You can't like you can't publish anything that might reveal who the twins are. Um, but for derivatives that are derived from the data, it's not strict. Okay. So that's H we're done with HCP, which is a big chunk here, and on to another data set. Okay, so our next data set is the natural scenes data set. Um, now, this is, a, as you might guess, this is a, a vision-focused data set. Um, but what's part of what's interesting about the natural scenes data set, or NSD, is that it's an example of a very, of a very narrow but deep data set. Like, essentially, they took a small number of subjects and scanned them a whole lot. So what we have is six subjects, I think, in the NSD, and um, there's just lots and lots of data for each of those subjects, very high quality data. Um, basically, in the NSD, they, they put people in the scanner and they showed them a bunch of natural scenes. And when I say natural scenes, that's sort of vision jargon for any image you would take with like a normal camera that's not uh, made up for the purposes of studying vision. So pictures of rooms, of nature, of people, of faces, any, anything like that is a natural scene. Um, so they, uh, they first of all, uh, put together this big data set of natural scenes. Um, they did some annotation of those natural scenes so you know what's in them. Um, and you can do analysis of what's in them. And then they, they scan these uh, six subjects for just hours and hours and hours, um, uh, 30 to 40 scan sessions, I think. Uh, and I believe actually here, I guess it was eight subjects, not six subjects. Um, uh, regardless, it's a massive data set. Uh, it represents a ton of time in the scammer, a, a similar amount of time to the Human Connectome Project, despite having a fraction of the subjects. Um, so uh, to access the natural scenes data sets, uh, we already saw a bit of an example of this earlier, um, but it's also on S3, so we can just make this cache path like we've done before. Um, and then we're going to make an S3 path to the natural scenes data set bucket. Um, pretty straightforward. And for the client, we can give this no sign request option because the natural scenes data set, unlike the human connectome project, doesn't require authentication to access. Um, so I can run that. Um, and then we'll, we can just do a, a quick listing of what's in the natural scenes data set. Um, and in the base, there are these subdirectories, NSD data, NSD data be betas, um, where they have the betas from the GLMs they solved. Um, so they have diffusion data, so they did collect diffusion data as part of the data set. Um, other, I'm, I'm not sure offhand what's in other. Uh, there's the raw data, there's the stimuli, which is the actual scenes they showed to everyone. Um, and then there's time series data. Uh, so most of what the data that I've worked with myself is in the NSD data directory. Um, so in particular, the, the NSD data directory, let's actually just take a look at what's in there. Just do that. Um, you can see that there's, uh, I believe these are beta weights. Um, there's some information about the experiments. There's all the free surfer directories. 
And there's actually multiple, uh, they did multiple um, runs of the T1 weighted image uh, for the natural scenes data set. So there are multiple T1s and multiple free surfer directories processed from different T1s as well as processed from the average T1. So if you're interested in looking at structure, this is kind of an interesting data set. Um, there's additional metadata about the experiments, et cetera. A lot of the data that um, is interesting is in the PP data directory, which stands for pre-processed data. So um, uh, uh, here we can just real quick look at the, the free surfer directory and you can see that there's uh, directories for all the subjects as well as some FS average directories. Um, uh, but uh, like I said, a lot of the data is in the pre-processed data directory. So um, if we look inside of the pre-processed data directory, I'll actually start by just, um, oops, uh, just looking at the pre-processed directory itself. If we look at the base path slash NSD data slash pre-processed data. Um, there's a directory for each subject. And if we then look inside of, for example, subject 01's directory, um, there's anatomical, behavioral, and then functional data at various, uh, at, at both one millimeter and 0.8 millimeter. And if we just look inside one of those functional directories, um, keeping in mind this is the pre-processed data, there's a uh, data directory, there's a bunch of kind of already processed uh, uh, information here. The, um, so these include things like the masks for the brain and the um, processed functional localizer data, which is uh, typically used to figure out where like uh, uh, functional localizer data is typically for finding uh, the parts of the ventral temporal cortex that respond to like words or faces or objects. Um, uh, there's a bunch of measurements of like the mean signal and and the variance explained by the renotopic mapping that they did and a whole bunch of just lots and lots of data here. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is this just is kind of to show you that there's a lot of work already put into this data set. There's not a whole lot of uh, processing you'd need to do to use it. Um, and there's if especially if you're interested in vision, there's just lots and lots of stuff here um, with a relatively small number of subjects. Um, just as a quick example, uh, we can go ahead and load in for that subject, <clears throat> excuse me, subject one uh, from that functional uh, 1.8 millimeter functional data, um, a map of the PRFR2, and that stands for population receptive field. So population receptive field is another kind of term that's not uh, quite, but approximately synonymous with retinotopy or retinotopic mapping. So um, this is the fraction of the variance explained, R2, like R squared. Um, uh, this is the fraction of the variance explained uh, uh, in the bold signal when we when we convert the bold signal into models of the population receptive fields. Um, and we can just go ahead and, and find this file and then load it in like we did uh, in the last notebook. And uh, what I think we'll find here is that we have a volume. Um, so the the shape of this file we read in, which is a nifty file, um, is the size of the volume. And if we just grab a slice out of the middle, kind of like we did previously, um, we can see what the variance explained looks like. And uh, um, no surprise, there's a whole bunch of va the variance of the bold signal explained in the back of the brain where the occipital cortex is, where um, uh, the you know where you'd find the brain that's processing vision. Um, so uh, this is kind of an example of how this data has already been pre-processed for you. You don't really have to do a lot of that work. Um, okay, uh, real quick, I just wanted to point out that uh, you can use NeuroPythy to uh, look at these data too, um, because they've done a lot of the processing for free surfer and such with NeuroPythy understands. So again, if we import NeuroPythy and tell it about our cache directory, um, uh, we and uh, I, I mentioned that there are the free surfer directories. So if we just look in one of these directories, um, we can see that this has label, MRI scripts, stats, surf, temp, touch. If you've used free surfer, these are probably familiar. If not, I'll just say that these are the subdirectories of a proper uh, subjects free surfer directory. Um, and we can we can uh, we can just point uh, um, NeuroPythy at the S three path for this free surfer subject, and it will actually understand that. And then we can just go ahead and make a cortex plot like we did before. Um, and this should, in just a second, show us the brain of this subject one of the natural scene state set. So there's the, the white surface of the subject's brain. Um, okay, 
what questions you have about the natural scenes data set. All right. Um, I think next we have the Healthy Brain Network. Okay, the Healthy Brain Network, yet another data set uh, that um, can be interesting to work with, especially if you're interested in questions about uh, development in childhood and adolescence. Um, this, uh, the Child Mind Institute is, uh, sorry, the Healthy Brain Network is a project of the Child Mind Institute, which is based in the New York City area. And they're collecting as part of this big project, uh, data from approximately 5,000 uh, adolescent children, adolescents in sort of that region um, at four different sites, uh, so four different scanners. Um, and the measurements include a broad range of psychiatric, behavioral, cognitive, lifestyle information, uh, both from healthy controls and children with a range of disorders. The um, part of their recruitment strategy is to recruit through um, clinician offices, and that way they're sort of enriched in clinical, um, in a variety of uh, clinical disorders. So the focus really is on sort of mental health and its uh, evolution in childhood, adolescence, and the brain basis. Um, the data, the neuroimaging data is openly available uh, through the Thousand Functional Connectomes Project uh, Initiative for Neuroimaging Data Sharing, International Neuroimaging Data Sharing Initiative, FCPND. And there's a paper that describes the, the data set, the approach that came out in 2017 um, in scientific data that you can read and sort of try to do, if you want to understand a little bit better about how this data was collected and uh, kind of the, the approach and um, the kinds of data that are available. Now, there's a lot of uh, phenotypic data there, like a variety of uh, standardized uh, clinician administered evaluations, uh, intelligence tests, uh, tests of language ability and so on. Uh, and those are actually protected by the AD usage agreement. So those will be a little tricky for us to say use next week, but if you're interested and this is relevant to your research, you can access those data. Uh, and in fact, similar to what Noah said about um, HCP, we can sort of figure out a way where you give me some code and I run that because I have a data usage agreement that allows me, but it's, it's a little complicated because the data is a bit of a spread all over many different tables. So I'll just caveat that a little bit, but it might get a little hairy. But age, sex, and handedness are all publicly available. So if you wanna ask questions that relate age to, um, to brain properties, you can certainly do that. Um, so, you know, there are different uh, kinds of measurements there, including uh, uh, task and rest fMRI. There's uh, task and rest EG as well, and uh, diffusion MRI. And uh, again, my group has worked a little bit on the uh, diffusion MRI that's in there. And we did, among other things that we did with this uh, diffusion MRI, well, the thing that we did first was to uh, process and quality control this data because these are children. Uh, the quality varies quite a bit between individuals. So we did a big project where we um, did a combination of different things to quality control the data, including having experts look at a subset of the data and then uh, putting up this, this was uh, 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 one of the things that Anisha did when she was a postdoc here was to create this web-based app that allows you to then put online images of the brain and ask uh, members of the community to go to this app and then um, classify each image as a good image or a bad image. So she did that with the T1 weighted images from the Healthy Brain Network. And then uh, Adam Richie Halford, who was a postdoc with me, then extended that app to the diffusion MRI. And we had a um, large number of members of the community go on and uh, kind of classify images. And then we trade a neural network um, based on that relatively large data set. So first we benchmarked the community based on the experts so that we knew for each community member how much they matched, their, their answers matched an expert. And then we took this, this calibrated data and we trained a neural network to do quality control on the data. 
and apply that then to the, the entire, well, to at that point we had 2,100 uh, yeah. subjects. Um, so in addition to, and this, this pertains specifically to the diffusion MRI data. So in addition to the data itself, you have uh, now, if you're interested in sort of questions about data quality, there's an, a subset there with expert uh, um, QC data, and then a large number of community QC data, and then a neural network uh, QC and this neural network. It, it turns out this neural network is rather accurate when you compare it within kind of a gold standard subset that was uh, annotated by the experts. Um, so it's a pretty accurate neural network. And if you're interested in kind of quality, questions about data quality, that could be a nice data set to work with. Uh, um, the data is all, uh, is all navigable also. So you can look at what's available at this website that's here in this notebook. Um, um, so in here, there's they're actually um, in, in this address, which is kind of a, a web view of the S3 bucket where this data is stored. So this, this is stored in the FCP Indies um, bucket. There's sub, uh, a folder called um, projects and in here there are several different projects. Uh, those of you who were in the machine learning session with me heard about Abide and Abide 2. So that data is also in here uh, and actually many other, there's this interesting HD, ADHD 200 data set in here, multiple different data sets. Uh, but if you go into HBN and you go into the bids curated part of it, so yeah, I should mention we also, uh, or rather, folks in Ted Satterwitz's uh, group at, at Penn also curated the data to be compliant with bids. Um, and you go into derivatives here, you will find an AFQ folder, which is, well, first you will find a QSI prep, oh, derivatives, a QSI prep folder, which is the diffusion data that has been pre-processed, including all this QC that I mentioned, but also this AFQ folder that then includes um, here, I'll, I'll do this in the notebook also. Um, well, here's the, here is the table with the participants. Uh, this table includes these uh, quality control scores over here. So this is the deep learning QC score. There's several different models. There's expert QC score. A lot of these are NANs because only 200 of the rows have expert QC score, uh, but there's some models based on the community members. And then there's this deep learning uh, QC score. And then there are also um, AFQ track profiles. So here's the left corticospinal tract of one of the, uh, the FA along the length of the corticospinal tract of one of the uh, subjects in, in HBN. Um, I should say this, this kind of stuff, like tissue properties in the white matter change a lot in childhood and adolescence. So again, if you're interested in sort of looking at development, uh, this could be a good, a good target for, um, for hacking. Um, I think that's all I have to say about HBN. What questions do you have about HBN, about the project largely, this QC stuff, fusion data? Okay. Okay, so the last data set we're gonna talk about is not really a data set, it is a collection of data sets. Um, so openneuro.org, uh, we can actually just go to openneuro.org uh, and uh, on openneuro.org, you can you can search for data sets by modality or browse. Um, here, I could search for something. Well, uh, so an example of a data set on Open Neuro is the Study Forest data set. Has anyone heard of the Study Forest data set? Yeah, so it's a it's a data set where they had people watch Forrest Gump in the scanner, among a bunch of other things. Um, and it's had a bunch of uh, additions to it since then. I assume that if I type in study forest here, it's going to find it. Um, I didn't actually test that ahead of time. Yeah, forest gum. Um, so uh, open neuro is a great resource in part because, well, it's a great resource for multiple reasons. First of all, if you want to do analysis of, um, of, uh, of, of MRI data or pet data or whatever kind of, of neuroimaging data, um, there are almost certainly a bunch of data sets on open neuro that you can use and it's all free and you don't have to, um, you don't typically don't even have to register anything. You just can use it. It's all also all in bids. 
Um, so the data sets are in a nice format that we have good documentation for that we can read and understand. Um, so uh, uh, additionally, the other reason that I think Open Neuro is a great uh, resource is because um, if you have a data set that you've collected and you've put it in bids, you can put it on Open Neuro and you don't need to pay for storage. So whereas um, if, if you've collected your own data set and you don't want to put it in bids and you want to put it on S3 yourself, you're going to have to pay for that S3 bucket or find someone who's willing to, to donate that S3 bucket, get convince Amazon to pay for it or something. With Open Neuro, um, even though Open Neuro is all on S3, uh, you, you can just deposit in Open Neuro and, and they'll handle it. So uh, someday when you've all collected uh, great big data sets and want to publish them, keep Open Neuro in mind. So to uh, access uh, Open Neuro, Open Neuro is just on S3 like all these others. So we're going to do basically the same workflow we've had in the other notebooks. We're going to make a cache path here, make sure it exists. And then uh, we connect to S3 colon slash slash open neuro.org slash. And then we give it a data set ID. So uh, here, I think I have this set for the NYU retina data dataset, which is another vision data set. Um, I think that since we just looked up the forest data set, I'll use it instead. And we'll just see how it goes. Looks like it is, um, and you can get its for, its number right here. It's the data set 000113. Um, so I'm just gonna go over here and replace that with, uh, this is now gonna be the uh, the Forrest Gump data set. Um, and if we just do, uh, no, ignore the fact that this says NYU base path. I wrote this for the NYU Renatopy data set, but since we've already talked about a couple of vision data sets and also the Forrest Gump data set is a vision data set, I figure I'll use this one. Um, so if we look at the uh, LS of the, the Forrest Gump data set, we see directories for a bunch of subjects. Um, we see some other, some task related files. Uh, I don't see a derivatives, oh, there it is, derivatives directory. Um, so if we wanted to see what derivatives there are, um, and just as a reminder, derivatives are any, uh, derivatives is the directory in bids where you store any kind of post-processing after uh, the uh, the raw data, you, you typically put that in the derivatives directory. And there's some, uh, some alignment information and physiology logs and stuff like that in this directory. Um, so, uh, so basically all of the data sets in, uh, openneuro.org are available in this one openneuro.org S3 bucket, uh, with just the different data set IDs. So it's very easy to access these data sets. Um, so as an example here, we can look at, uh, participants.tsv is a standard, uh, bids file. So even though I have this set up for the NYU data set, I suspect it will work here, um, we should be able to just read in that participant's uh, file and we get information about gender, age, handedness, uh, hearing problems, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a bunch of data here. Um, and these are just metadata about the participants in the study. Okay. Um, now uh, I'm just gonna skip this part because this is about uh, looking at the free surfer directories and um, the study forest uh, data set doesn't have free surfer directories. Um, at least I don't think it includes them built in. Uh, but uh, the uh, NYU written atopy data set, which this notebook was originally written for, it has free software directories. And just like we saw with the natural scenes data set, you can point uh, NeuroPython to whatever uh, open neuro uh, free software directory and it will understand those. Um, but since we're since I'm not looking at the NYU, I'll just skip that. Um, so uh, so yeah, open neuro is a great resource uh, if. Whatever you're you're looking at doing next week, um, if you think uh, a data set would be useful, I highly recommend searching Open Neuro um, and and looking for uh, around for uh, data sets that might fit your your particular questions. Uh, what questions do you have about Open Neuro? Yeah. I mean, that's a question, but if you go on Open Neuro now, you know, if you go on MRI. Mm -hmm. There is this little search at the participant level with no label here. Where is it? Just, uh, oh. search, yeah, right also. Just under the search, of the, the, under the, on the left, up a little bit, one more up now. Oh, yes. So, search with no label. And sure, this is to like gather a total of subjects that have certain characteristics, uh, demographics or uh, instruments, things like that. You can get that total. 
and then you get the like okay that's not as easy <laughs> and then you get the uh, the actual data in data lab so if you have installed data lab on your computer you can just fit those things uh, well, so for if, in case people on Zoom couldn't hear, um, basically, if you're looking for cohorts across studies where you have like some uh, uh, particular filters you want to use, um, Neurobigger will help you find cohorts of subjects, and then it will help you uh, use another tool we haven't talked about called DataLad to download those um, those data. DataLad is a kind of general purpose uh, data management tool that works a little bit like GitHub uh, or Git uh, to manage data um, and data sets. Uh, if you're interested in using that, then um, talk to us next week when we're doing these projects. Although, um, if you can get away with using Cloud Pathlet instead of downloading all the data, that's something better. But uh, but sometimes sometimes you need something like data. Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, other questions about data sets in general, or 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 about the hack projects next week? Oh, uh, we don't have Slack open. Can someone shout it out? Oh, uh, I uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I see JB's shaking his head. Uh, so I think. Although you can find some of the data sets that are in general, the answer is. Okay. okay, so just for the people on Zoom, it uh, sounds like um, you can find some European data sets on Open Neuro, but as a general rule, you can't, the GDPR doesn't allow you to uh, to put data sets on Open Neuro if you're in Europe. Yeah. Uh, are there examples of previous hack projects from previous years? Yes, they're on the website, I believe. It's on the website and I'll post some links to other places where you can see more. Yeah. yeah. So I, I missed the, you, it sounded like you said crosswalks. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I feel like this question is getting complicated. But um, basically, when I say crosswalk, I guess you mean like linking an individual subject's neuroimaging methods to their behavioral data. I see. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, I'm gonna repeat it for Zoom and correct me if I don't have the right idea here, but um, the question is about, uh, for some of these data sets, what, what's available to link subjects to their behavioral data or to their the other data that might've been collected at the site that isn't specifically neuroimaging data? Yeah, um, so uh, that's gonna be different in every data set. Um, for a lot of the open neuro data sets, there is gonna be this participants file, which will just contain a lot of the that kind of data for the subjects if they included it. Um, for the human connectome project, that's in things like the restricted data or in CSV files you can download separately once you've agreed to those terms. Um, and in, in the human connectome project, at least, they just have a CSV file with a list of subjects of the actual subject IDs that, and then all of their behavioral and genetic and stuff, those kinds of measurements. Um, uh, I, I, can't, I can't say uh, precisely how all the other data sets store those data, but um, uh, I would I would say that in general it's it's going to be something like a CSV file file, file probably that just connects the subject to the data, um, assuming you can get access to it. Yeah. Yep, yep. Other questions? Okay. Um, we need to say anything else. I think I think uh, uh, we can we can finish just a few minutes early here and. Um, go to lunch and we'll see you back at 1.30 for Stephanie Noble's talk. All right, thanks everyone.